Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I would like to firstly start by doing what I always do whenever I am blessed to be in a gathering like this and that is to say simply alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah that we have been blessed to be in a space where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is mentioned and where we are joined with our believing brothers and sisters on the search for khair. There are some people who intended to be here, it wasn't in their qadr and they're not here. And some of you, you didn't even know about this a week ago and here you are by Allah's grace. So I say alhamdulillah that he has brought us here together, inshallah to be reminded Actually, I've come all the way to address you from Egypt, actually. Um, I live in Egypt at the moment. I came via London and Qadr Allah, I'm here with you. And I've come to you with a message. It's a very strong message. It's a message you may not have heard before. And it's a message from the dark side. <laughs> How many of you are married? Can you put your hands up? Okay, how many of you would like to be married? Put your hands up. How many of you wish you were not married? Don't put your hands up. Okay. So, I have a question for the honest ones in the room. Who here has ever been annoyed with their spouse? Put your hands up. Mashallah, thank you. Thank you, brother. Who here is, at the moment, annoyed with their spouse right now? You don't have to put your hand up, but just acknowledge that right now, you know what? Yeah, we're going through some issues. And then who here thinks that they may, one day, in the future, be annoyed with their spouse? Put your hand up. If you don't put your hand up, then you're delusional, because for sure you will one day be annoyed with your spouse, subhanAllah. So... I ask these questions because we, as human beings and as Muslims, we have a very strange idea of marriage and married life. I'd like to share a little bit about my story, inshallah, to give you some context. So, alhamdulillah, um, if you don't know anything about me, I was uh, born in Leeds and I grew up in Zimbabwe and I became a Muslim while I was at university. So, I'm a revert. And I became Muslim at university. I got married soon after. I was about 22. And alhamdulillah, if anyone remembers Dawa in the late 90s, early 2000s, so much hope, so much passion for the deen, wanting to do the right thing, wanting to be good Muslims. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me my Muslim brother. And I married at 22, alhamdulillah, to a revert. And we had five children together. We ended up living in the UK and then going to Egypt and living there for 10 years. And in that time, we learned Deen, Arabic, Quran. We raised our children. And one day, I had gone to dinner with a friend or the sister of mine. And I left my husband at home with the children. He was at work and then he came home. And when I came home, it was, it, he was already asleep, and my youngest needed me. So I, I went to sleep with my youngest. When I woke up in the morning, I was woken up by my daughter saying, Daddy's not waking up. And some of you may have heard this story, but it's important for today's conversation. I went in to check on my husband, and he was unconscious. And we couldn't get him to respond. We didn't know what had happened. We called the ambulance and they came and they took him to hospital to see what was happening. And long story short, he had had a stroke and he was in a coma uh, with brain damage and they did not think that he would wake up. So in a moment, our worlds turned upside down. Allahu Akbar. They had him in hospital, under observation. He didn't respond, although he was stable. And as a family, we had to come to terms with what it would mean if he woke up and was damaged 
and would not be able to be the husband and the father and man that he had been. We had to come to terms with the possibility of him staying in a coma long term, because as you know, we never can tell. And we had to come to terms with the possibility of him never waking up. A couple came to see me at the hospital. In fact, no, a sister came to see me at the hospital. And she said, how are you? And I said, sis, to be honest, I don't know. She said, I want to give you something. And what that sister gave me, you know, I don't even remember that sister's face. But what she gave me, I don't know her name, and I don't remember her face. But what she gave me is a gift that I have given to thousands of people in that time, and I'm going to give that gift to you as well. And it's the gift of a true story about a couple whose child was uh, terminally ill. And this child was about six years old, and she was in the hospital, and the doctors were saying, she's not going to make it. So the parents would go every day to the hospital to check on their daughter, and the doctors would tell them more bad news. And every time they would give them the news, the husband would look at his wife and say, not yet. They would come back the next day, the doctors would give them more bad news, the husband would say to his wife, not yet. And this happened day in and day out until one day they came and they were told that their daughter was no more. And then the husband turned to his wife and said, now. And they both fell into sujood of shukr. The hospital staff were horrified. Eh, what is this? You've just lost your, what? Are they crazy? What are they doing? Why are they saying that? Why are they making sujood? What is happening? SubhanAllah. And when they asked the question, the couple said, we were blessed to be the mother and father of this beautiful little girl for six whole years. And in those years, we had the honor of parenting her, of loving her, of caring for her, the reward of looking after her when she became ill. We are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we had with her. And that is why we are in sujood of shukr. When I heard that story, my brothers and sisters, I decided that I would do exactly the same thing. No matter that I had had 15 years with my husband, I knew that I could never be ungrateful for that time that I had had with him and everything that came with it. So I decided if la qadr Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to take him home, I would be one of those who would be in sujood. And so it was a week or so later at 2 a.m., my phone rang and the doctor said, Asalaamu Alaikum, I said, Wa Alaikum Asalaam. He said, uh, he had, um, uh, like, SubhanAllah, the, the, the details of it do not even register anymore. But they tried and nothing could be done and he is, he has returned to Allah. And I said, Jazakallah Khairan. And I put the phone down and I made sujood. Everyone here who is married, or has been married, or would like to be married. This is my message to you from the dark side. Your time with your spouse is finite. It is not limitless. There are no guarantees. Your time with your spouse is literally sand falling through an hourglass. And so everybody who right now, if you have a spouse, no matter if you put your hand up and you said that you were annoyed or that you're annoyed or whatever, ask yourself, what if Allah took him tomorrow? What if Allah took her next week? Am I prepared? For that? Have I lived 
in the knowledge that this person is on loan to me. I don't own this person. This person doesn't own me. They are on loan. They are amana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has trusted me with this person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take back what belongs to him. So few of us live with the reality that our loved ones are on loan to us. We take them for granted. We get annoyed. We get put off. We put everything else ahead of them because we think they'll always be there. So my message to you from the dark side, the first message is, don't do that. Don't take your spouse for granted because wallahi, they are on loan. This is one of the lessons that I learned, one of the main lessons that I learned from my experience. Alhamdulillah, it's helped me and I pray that it, it lands with anyone. If, 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 if you picked up what I was putting down there, just, just give me an indication that you get it. Alhamdulillah. So I just want to share with you, just off the back of that experience and other experiences of my own and others, I just want to share with you five lessons, five of those keys to a successful marriage. And let's be frank with each other. A successful marriage is one in which spouses can help each other to gain Allah's pleasure and earn Jannah. Yes? Are we agreed on this? So for a minute, let's forget all the nonsense from Hollywood, Bollywood, social media, our families, our communities, and what everyone else is saying is successful. Because today we are in an epidemic of unrealistic expectations and concern with the dunya that is destroying our homes and selfishness and self-centeredness that is breaking apart families. So let's all firstly come to an agreement that a truly successful marriage is one in which the husband and the wife help each other towards Jannah. If we can agree on that, we've got something to build on. So the first thing, the first key, is to be intentional. The Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, actions are but by intention. And we know how difficult it is with other human beings, especially the spouse, children as well. There's so many personal things that come into play. We can forget that, hey, hold on a minute. This is for Allah. This man this woman is amana, and whatever I do for this person is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for him, for his sake. Everything that, we know this, I'm not here to share a hadith and ayat that you all know. I'm simply here to remind you, because sometimes we forget, and the reminder benefits the believer. We get so used to men going out to work so you can pay bills. We are grateful, but it's for Allah. This is your path towards him and his pleasure. Sisters, we get so fed up with cooking every day and making sure his food is this particular way that he likes, right? Yeah, or no. Forgetting, this is part of my ibadah. This is just one of the ways in which I can earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. When you speak kindly to your wife, when you listen to your husband, when you help your wife with the kids, when you give your husband some ease when he's come home, when you help in the household, when you look after his mother-in-law, when you call her father, all of these little interactions that are so mundane, these are all acts of worship when you have the intention. And how many of you would be more willing to do that thing that you know he likes if you knew that this is not even for you, my friend. <laughs> this is not even for you. This is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of the brothers would feel the same about their wives? It's not, listen, my darling, it's not about you. This is akhirah. 
Okay, this is akhirah. When I give to you, when I forgive you, when I listen to you, when I am kind, when I'm forgiving, when I'm patient, when I'm supportive, when I'm strong, when I lead, when I set boundaries, all of this is all part of me showing up as the husband or wife that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be. It's not personal. This is akhirah. This is me investing in my hereafter. Because I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is counting all of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware, brothers, sisters, every time that you push back against your nafs in order to be able to honor your wife or your husband, this is, Allah is aware. This is part of you purifying yourself, refining yourself as a believer. Sisters, every time, every time that you hold your tongue, when you know you want to just let loose for the sake of Allah, this is you refining yourself in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So being intentional, being intentional changes the flavor of daily life completely. And I would invite everybody to consider how intentional they are in all aspects of their lives, not just in marriage, but also with our parenting, with how we are with our families, with our work. How many of us are doing those daily deeds, seeking Allah's face? The more we can do that, the more barakah there will be in our lives, inshallah. The second key to a successful marriage, according to our definition, is to embrace gratitude. The son of Adam, if he had one valley of gold, what would he want? He would want two, he would want another. This is our nature as human beings, unfortunately. However, gratitude magnifies what you already have. And when you embrace gratitude, brothers, sisters, it allows you to feel how very blessed you are to have what you have. Because there are many who do not have what you have. This is the shift we need to make. Many of us focus on what we do not have. Put your hand up if you know that's true. We focus on what we don't have. What hasn't happened yet? What didn't go the way we wanted it to go? The failings, the failures, how much we've fallen short, that's what we focus on. That's a lot of the time why we are so unhappy in our relationships, with ourselves, with our whole life trajectory. Because we are looking at what's not there and what's not going well. But all it takes is a shift in perspective for you to start actually looking at what is there. What is happening? What is going well? What are the blessings? Subhanallah. You know that's true. Which of the blessings of your Lord will you deny? You could absolutely not stop if you started to count your blessings. And I challenge everyone in this room to a competition to see who will run out of blessings first. Because you know we would be here until Aisha. Embracing gratitude in your marriage is being grateful for your spouse for the good that you get from that spouse, for the ease that they give you, for the blessings that have come into your life as a result of that spouse. So much of the time, we're looking at our life partner with critical eyes. Put your hand up if you know that's true. Why can't she be more like this? Why can't he be more like that? My mother was this way, but my father always said this. But I read in the book it said that, but I saw on social media this. Looking at your partner with critical eyes, what will you see? The failings, the failures, the falling short. Looking at your partner with the eyes of gratitude allows you to see the blessings, the barakah, the bounty. And the more we focus on the blessings, the barakah and the bounty, the more blessed we feel. 
And I'm going to drop this one for those who are doubting this. Many of you think that for your marriage to improve, the other person needs to change. You don't have to put your hand up. You don't have to put your hands up, I know. Many of us feel the problems we're having in our marriage is because he doesn't do. The problems we're having in our marriage, she doesn't. He always, she never. I will invite you to embrace something that is much more powerful and positive and productive, and that is to embrace gratitude and start looking at the good of your spouse and appreciating it. When a woman feels appreciated, she goes the extra mile. Guess what? When a man feels appreciated, he goes the extra mile. Brothers, is that true? Yes? It's interesting to me when I hear complaints of the brothers and I hear complaints of the sisters, very often it's exactly the same things. I feel underappreciated. I feel like he, she takes me for granted. I feel he's never satisfied. She's never satisfied. And again, it's because we are doing it to ourselves. It's not because your husband is not doing enough. It's not because your wife is not doing enough. It's because you're looking at what they're not doing and not appreciating what they are doing. Now, of course, there's always room for improvement. We know this. But a spouse who feels appreciated is more likely to make changes than one who feels like it's never enough. It doesn't matter what I do, you're never happy. So embracing gratitude, because eventually, and I'm going to keep bringing it back to this, your spouse is a man any good that you're getting through your spouse, they're just a vessel. It's just what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you. That's what you're getting through this person. So for the person who is being the vessel, you are blessed and honored. And for the person who's receiving Allah's khair, the gratitude is eventually for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're ungrateful to your spouse, who are you actually being ungrateful to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who brought the spouse in the first place, the one who created the spouse, the one who put you two together. So embracing gratitude, inshallah. And trust me, I am not sitting here with a stick to beat anyone and say, hey, you're all ungrateful. No, this is the nature of human beings. But as a reminder to be grateful for what you have and feel the barakah of what you have before it's taken away. That's the message from the dark side. Don't wait for it to be taken away for you to say, subhanAllah, I was so blessed. He was so this. She was so that. We were so whatever. Don't wait for that time. Be grateful now and see the barakah multiply. Inshallah. Third tip for the successful marriage, my dear brothers and sisters, is be akhira focused. This dunya is a deception. I'm going to say that again. This dunya is a deception. And it will never be enough. It will never be enough. We hear so much now of couples splitting up because people want more. They want better. They want younger. They want richer. They want more, more, more. Wallahi, you will never find your satisfaction. You will never get your fill. Because this dunya is not designed to fulfill us. And the truth is, as Muslims, we've lost many, many important values that previous generations had. Many of us see previous generations as toxic. It's problematic, backward, old-fashioned. But they knew a few things that we've lost today. Because today the Muslim is focused on dunya. And being happy in this dunya. And having all the wonderful things in this dunya. And having the best Instagram feed in this dunya. To be the talk of the town, to be the envy of your friends, to have the biggest wedding, 
the most handsome husband, whatever it, the case may be. We're competing in the dunya and we're losing our akhirah in the process. It is so much easier to love and respect and serve and protect your spouse when all you're thinking of is, this is an investment in akhirah. This is an investment in the next life. And when you invest in akhirah, you can never lose. Is that not true? That is the one investment that will never fail. So sister, brother, if right now you're simply holding on, you're not happy. It's not great. It's not all you dreamed it would be. Let's be real. Not all marriages are a walk in the park. In fact, most of them go through the woods and the deserts and the mountains and, and this way and that, right? But some people are in relationships where they are not happy, and that's true. I would ask you to please consider, can I worship Allah while I'm in this situation? Can I give this person their rights for the sake of Allah? Can I invest in my akhirah through this person? And if the answer is yes, then sis, please take heart, for all is not lost. Brother, take heart, all is not lost. When we can be akhirah focused, trust me, it removes the ego from the situation. It removes our desires and craving for the dunya and what this dunya has. Because anybody who's lived in this world long enough knows all that glitters is not gold. And those things that we are chasing and that we're fighting for, they come at a cost. And we don't bear in mind the true cost of the things that we're chasing because we just see the glitter and we're like, yeah, that's what I want. But there's a price to be paid for everything. So be very careful what you choose to buy because you will always pay a price, inshallah. Okay, so the fourth key. Be realistic. Be realistic. Again, we've all been programmed. We've all been fed the romance and the Hollywood and the Bollywood and the songs and the social media and everything. And what happens is we build a false image in our minds of what marriage should be. And the gap between expectation and reality is where frustration lies. The gap between expectation up here and reality here is where frustration lies. If your expectations are here and your reality is here, you only have a small space for frustration, right? If your expectations are here and your reality is here, no frustration, it's just satisfaction. But if your reality is here and your expectations are up here, lots of frustration. And the goal is to be hopeful, yes, to aim high, yes, but also to be realistic and not delusional. Newsflash, every one of you is a human being. We didn't know that, did we? We're all human beings, all created with flaws. We will all make mistakes. Not one of us is perfect. And yet so often in marriages, we look at the spouse and we expect them to be perfect. We expect them not to make mistakes. We expect them to get it right every time. We expect them to read our minds. We expect them to know exactly what to do every single time. And when they don't, it's a problem. Where did we get this from? It's not from the deen. It's not even from the Prophet Sallallahu and his family. And that if anybody should have a realistic view of marriage that balances reality and hope, it's the Muslims. Because we have such a lofty example in terms of what we are taught, that we are libas, that we are garments for each other that there is so much barakah in the relationship between the man and the woman. So we, we have this hope, we have those lofty goals. But then we have the lived example. And the lived example is real. It's not fairy tales. It's human nature. 
So being realistic means you manage your expectations. And I really wish that there were more young people in the audience today. Maybe we have some young people, mashallah. But young people need to hear this now even more than us older people. Because the younger generation has completely overblown ideas of what marriage is. The expectations that they have of their spouse, of what marriage looks like, what it feels like, what it should be, completely devoid, divorced from reality. So when we can be realistic and be humble, this person, subhanAllah, how many of you have ever looked in the mirror with an honest eye and asked yourself, would I be happy marrying to myself? I know it's a strange concept, but if you were honest and you looked in the mirror and you said, with, with this that I do and this that I hate doing and this that I always say and this, 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 would I be happy being married to myself? And if the answer is not 100% yes, which it shouldn't be, by the way, because there's nobody that can look in the mirror and say, oh, da, 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 it's a yes from me. No, we all have flaws. We all have characteristics that are not great, personality flaws, mistakes that we make, things that annoy other people, things that annoy ourselves. How many of you are frustrated with yourself because of your own inabilities? Whether it's that you want to be more on time, but it's not coming together. You want to be more in shape, but it's not coming together. You want to be a better mum, it's not working out, whatever. My point is, if we can come together in humility and realistic expectations of each other, it will remove so much of the unnecessary, unnecessary fitna between us. Where is your humility? Where is our humility when we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will judge us and he knows everything? How many of us have lowered the wing of humility to our spouse when he's having a bad day? When she's having a bad day? When he's falling short in a certain area? When she's not what you wanted or what you expected in any area? Surely... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed that we are to be companions on this journey, surely this should be a space of safety. This marriage should be a, a space of safety where we can be human and humble and say sorry and grow and give second chances and think the best of each other, have husnul dhan. Surely this should be the space. But it will only be that space if we make that decision. And no, not waiting on your spouse to make that decision. You have to make the decision first. You have to let go of the things that are holding you back from truly having a successful marriage. Things like pride. Things like arrogance. Expectations that are unrealistic. Whatever it is that's holding you back, you get to make that decision and then see how it shows up in your relationship, in your marriage, inshallah. May Allah bless us all with the best. Fifth thing, now this is, again, the message from the dark side. Remember death. Remember death. How long do you have? Really? Do you know? Does any of us know? So many of the things that we allow to poison our marriages because we give them attention, we put energy towards them, we go on and on and on about them. Those things are worthless. There is no need to focus on that thing. But in our heads, it's the biggest thing. For example, his mum always criticizes your cooking. You don't have to put hands up, it's fine. Say it's an issue, right? We know how that feels. We don't like it. I get it. No one likes that. 
Is it a reason to destroy a household though? Should it be? Is it a reason to fight every single week? Is it a reason to separate in the beds? Should it be? That's what I mean about remembering death. Because if we remember death and we remember that, hold on, this man, this woman, is not guaranteed to be mine for life. He, she is amana. And I want to do right by this woman or by this man. And I'm not going to let petty differences get between us. I'm not going to let minor fitna split up this household. I'm not going to let my desires split up this household. I'm not going to let my unrealistic expectations or my terrible temper or my impatience destroy this union. That's a decision, ladies and gentlemen. That is a decision. You get to make it. I'm not going to let this, this, this issue come into this space and mess up this space. Because I don't know how many of us think about this. I'm sure we do. But our children are watching our every move. They are breathing the air around us. They are learning from what we say and what we don't say, from what we do and what we don't do. And so even if for your own sake you can't be bothered, please bear in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted you and your husband, you and your wife, with these children. And that is the work. That is the work that is before the two of you. Sometimes you just have to say it's not about you. It's about these kids. It's about akhirah and the amana of these children. And I mention this not because I want us to go back to a time where people said, oh, we stay together for the sake of the kids. We've heard this before, right? I'm sure we have all will know about this, right? People say, oh, we stay together for the sake of the kids. Or don't stay together for the sake of the kids. Everyone has a different view. And what I would say is, while you don't want to stay in a miserable, toxic marriage for the sake of your kids, can you stay in a decent marriage for the sake of your children? Are you willing to sacrifice a little bit for the sake of your children? Are you willing to put your own, your own desires to the side for a bit for the sake of your children? I don't know. It's a question for all of us to answer. But it's a very real question. Because the reality is for some couples, yes, they would be happier apart. The man can't wait for her to go. She can't wait to kick him out. But it doesn't end there, ladies and gentlemen. That is not where the story ends. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I've noticed in our community, especially online, divorce is becoming glamorized. Divorce, I don't know about what the brothers know, but your sisters, you know what I'm talking about. Divorce is becoming glamorized. Obviously, we know about not wanting to stigmatize divorce the way it used to be. However, there is a balance that must be struck. Because yes, sis, you may feel free now that he's not there throwing his socks all around the place, but the story doesn't end there. And when we break a family, brothers and sisters, it's not just you and your spouse that have to find new, life, new, new, new ways of living and new lives. Your children have now lost both parents in the home. And we are all aware of the statistics for those children. Not only that, what about our families? What about our parents and their grandchildren? What about the father-in-law who loved his son-in-law and now there's a mushkila, there's a problem. The mother-in-law who actually wanted to see her grandchildren and now there's a mushkila, there's a problem. So if we are able to just pull back a bit, remember what we committed to and why, and do it for the sake of Allah. Not for the culture, not for the community, not so people won't say your name, 
But can you do this for the sake of Allah? Because I'm, the other message from the dark side is that it is the wild west out there. Who's not married here? Put your hands up those who are not married. Is it nice? Is it fun? Is it fun? She's still young. <laughs> She's still young, mashallah. Those young, mashallah, young people, they, they, they see life very differently, mashallah. But trust me, for those of you who are married, and I say this especially, I don't know what happens with the brothers, but I know with the sisters this can be a fitna. Stop fantasizing about being single. Stop fantasizing about divorce and imagining your life once he's gone or she's gone. Stop doing it. Shaitan will get in there and he will convince you that your life is going to be so good once you don't have to deal with him and his family anymore. Once she's out and you're free to do whatever you want, you're going to find a better one. This one doesn't deserve you. All of this, all these thoughts here that we are seeing circulating, please, itaqullah. It's not what you think. And you ask anybody who has been single for the year, two years, five years, six years, trying to find a spouse, they know how awful it is. And any sister or brother who's a single parent, who's trying to make a life, you ask them how hard it is. So before you go to divorce or you push for divorce or you say, if you do this and that, I'm leaving. Before you do that, before you threaten your husband, before you threaten your wife, please go and speak to a sister who's been divorced for three years. Not the one who just left, by the way, because the one who just left, she's still in the, the afterglow of the freedom. She's loving it. Three years later, when she realizes actually how important her husband was in the house, many sisters look at their husbands and think, what do you do anyway? What's the point of you? Because your expectation of what a man must do is here and maybe he's maybe around here. Yeah, yeah? Put your hands up, sisters, if you know what I'm talking about. You don't have to, it's fine. Sisters know what I mean. And maybe the brothers do too. Maybe you hear this at home, I don't know. But the point is, you will not know the value of your husband or your wife until they are gone. And in the case of a death, of course, it's too late. There's nothing you can do and it's not in your hands. But in the case of a divorce, especially a divorce that you pushed for, you've got no one to blame but yourself. When your children miss their dad and he doesn't come around as often as he used to and it starts to become a bit problematic, this is the bed. When you want to get married again and brothers are like, how many kids have you got, sis? Mm, four kids. Uh, this is the bed. When your son says to you, mom, I don't want another man in the house. I don't want you to get married again. And there's a problem and he's kicking off and you know he needs his dad to sort him out. But dad's married somebody else in Morocco. <laughs> That's the bed. And I'm not saying that anyone's, I'm not excusing anyone's behavior. I'm simply holding up a mirror to what's happening in the community right now. And the way to avoid these broken homes and the way to avoid children growing up without both parents and the way to find peace within your relationship and peace with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with is embracing these five keys. To be intentional, to embrace gratitude, to be akhirah focused, to be realistic and to remember death. And brothers and sisters, this is my reminder to you and my message from the dark side, because those of you who are in the marriages, you have no idea what it's like on the other side. And those of you whose spouse is still alive, you also have no idea what it's like on the other side. And so I wanted to hopefully give you something to think about, hopefully something to ponder upon. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it and anything wrong that I've said is from myself and the shaitan. And all good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanaka Allahumma Rabbana bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumallahu khairan.